I love how the Lord has addressed his people. He has, uh, in, in sending his word from heaven, he has given the work of, of this delivery of his word to the, to the sons of men. So we don't have angels writing to men. We have men yeah. writing to men. Mm-hmm. Now, the angels are ministering spirits. Their, their work, uh, in my understanding, is largely unseen. I think that'll be something unfolded in, in the world to come, that we'll, we'll see the fullness of, of the, the angels' ministry to us. But in, in the Lord's ministry to us in this world... He, he has chosen to minister to us in some, with some very tangible means, and I'm looking at some of them right now. And you're looking at one of them by the grace of God. But this is the way that he inspired his word. He gave it to the holy prophets. He gave it to the holy apostles. He gave it to Moses. He gave it to Abraham. He worked through men. And this, this, the, the tangible aspect of this ministry is, is very is very much a mercy of the Lord that he's given to us. So, so I, like I've said before, I believe this is Paul, uh, that, that it's addressing the Hebrew uh, believers in this text. And he's, he's bearing his heart to these people. He's, not, he, he's written some hard words to the Hebrews, but it's not because they've just been a personal disappointment to him. It's not just because they, uh, they're running the risk of tarnishing his, his reputation. That's not it at all. In fact, to the Philippians, Paul said that he, he greatly longed after them in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Yes, amen. I, I want that to sink down into my soul more, that Paul, Paul was motivated. He, he worked, he labored, he wrote, he preached, he prayed in the bowels of Jesus Christ. There's a lot more in that I know that, that I haven't seen. Paul's, Paul's desires for the people of God was a result of Paul's fellowship with Jesus. I long after you. I have great desires towards you in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And so what he wrote to the Hebrews, see, it came from this. You see, we see Jesus' desire for the church through Paul. What Paul desired for the church, we can rest assured it's because that's what Jesus desired for the church. Now, this is uh, at a transition in Hebrews chapter 6. He's uh, given that parable of the ground, you know, that one ground that yielded uh, fruit, meat for them by whom it is dressed, another ground that yielded thorns and thistles and the danger associated with that. And, uh, and he, ex- he exhorts them. And then he's going to start in, in verse 13, the next verse after our text, uh, about the promise that he gives to Abraham. And the rest of the chapter then is dedicated to, to Abraham. And so this is kind of a transition between some, uh, some exhortations and how he's, he's introducing Abraham. He said, be not, this is my desire that you be not slothful, but uh, followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And then he goes directly into Abraham. So the follower, the, he's going to give them in the following verses a, a premier example of, of one to follow, whose faith to follow. With Abraham, he wavered not in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, and he inherited the promises. That's what Romans 4 says. So he's introducing Abraham uh, in this text, that you be not slothful. Now, it, it's not uh, at, at a very, very basic fundamental level, it's, it's not desirable for, for, for anyone to be slothful. That's right. it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a reproach for any creature made in the image of God to be slothful because God is a worker. God, God is diligent. What he does, he's, he's robed himself with a robe of zeal, the prophet says. So what God, what God does, he does with, with vigor, with zeal, with excellence, with glory, this is how this is. This is God's nature. He doesn't Amen. do anything uh, except that it's in accordance with His nature. Slothfulness is ungodly. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Just at just at a, at a yeah. just at a principle level, just as a at a basic fundamental level, all slothfulness is ungodly. Yeah. But there are there are different levels of slothfulness. There's different there's different aspects like. Yeah. It, to be slothful uh, in, uh, like, people can be slothful in their work ethic. They just, 
You know, they can they can do do good in some areas, but it, but when they're on the clock, they they're just terrible. I know I've seen people like this. It, it's just there's these things ought not to be, but they are. But but slothfulness is much bigger than just a bad work ethic. See, slothfulness. Somebody got to have a good work ethic, but then when it comes to the kingdom, they're slothful. See, this is particularly reprehensible. <clears throat> be not slothful. Now, just just by way of definition, it means sluggish, slothful. It means slug. I I just think it even just the word, just the mechanics of the word slothful. It sounds slow. You know, just to it just kind of a you just kind of you want to say it quick just to get over it, don't you? Yeah. Just a slothful, be not slothful. It just, it's kind of just the mechanics of the word, kind of kind of carry with it the feeling, the principle of the of of the word. Sluggish or dull. Now, this is dull is the word. That's actual definition uh, from uh, Merriam-Webster. But the Lord used the word dull in the book of Hebrews. You've become dull of hearing. And now He's exhorting them. Be not slothful, dull. So somebody who is, who is slothful, they're dull in their senses somehow. They're dull in their capacities. You know, you've seen, it's very troubling to see someone who has incredible potential and they don't do anything with it. Just such a, such a reproach that God can endow people with abilities and gifts and they, don't, they just don't do anything with it. That's yeah. dull. They've let their abilities become dull. I know that uh, many of us have talked here about the, the, the weight of this, uh, the possibility, this, this experience of being dull in your mind, dull in your thoughts, that you're, you have a hard time. You ever heard somebody say something and, in, in the assembly, I mean, and you just sense, boy, there's, he's seeing, they're seeing something I am not seeing. You feel dull in your mind. Uh, see, that's the, that's, in some way, and I, I'm, not, I'm not meaning to point the finger or accuse of anyone. I'm just talking about just the, just the reality here. Slothful is in the mind. It, 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 probably, it probably even starts in the mind because no, no one's going to be slothful with their hands unless, unless the sloth begins in, in their minds. By application, of course, it means lazy. That's one of the, the things that comes, comes, readily comes to mind. Slothful is just a lazy person. Now, um, I wasn't surprised to find that Solomon used the word slothful in the Scripture more than anyone else. There's only a couple times in the, in the New Testament Scriptures that, uh, that the Holy Spirit uses the word slothful, but Solomon used it over and over and over again. It's the antithesis of wisdom. It's, the, it's just the opposite. Sloth, wise people see that slothful, sloth that just isn't found where there's wisdom. It's foolish. Slothfulness is foolish. So Solomon said, you know, he, the sloth is the one that roasteth not the meat that he took while he was hunting. You know, that's just all the work and the investment and the taking of a life, and then you just let it go to waste. That's just, that's just slothful. He said he, the sloth doesn't, doesn't even bring his hand out of his bosom to raise it up to his mouth. That's just, that's just like, that's, isn't that just about as bad as it gets? The sloth, he stars himself because he won't raise his hand up to his mouth to feed himself. See, it's just it's an extreme um, um, expression, but that see that so, what Solomon was doing is showing the the the, uh, uh, the principle, the the spirit of slothfulness. It, it can make a person not even feed themselves because they're they're slothful. He said he talked about the field of the slothful that it grow it was overgrown with thorns thorns and thistles. Didn't maintain his investment. He he sowed in the field and then just they just let it go. And so his his. Uh, his labors were wasted because he was, he was uh, slothful. There's also some examples in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus told the parable about the man whose his fields yielded abundantly. So what did he say? He says, tear down the barns and build bigger ones. And he said, soul, take thine ease. He was a sloth. And Jesus called him a fool. He said, your, your soul is going to be required of you this night. Then whose will those things be that you have laid up for for yourself. Now, the danger of slothfulness is much more than just letting fields grow over and tearing down your barns and building building bigger barns. Those, those are, of course, reprehensible, and these things should not be found among the people of God. But but there's there's more to be seen here in this exhortation of be not slothful. Now he's t- he just ended these exhortations about the ground that was nigh unto cursing. I can't hardly conceive that he would go from that exhortation to work ethic to Abraham. 
See, it's, there's much more yeah. in, this, in this word of exhortation about slothful than just, than just work ethic, things that we can see uh, with our eyes and things that we do with our hands. There's, a deeper, there's deeper, more profound layers and, and uh, implications to slothfulness than just what we do with our hands. The Laodiceans were spiritually slothful. They thought they were rich and they were poor. They thought they had need of nothing, but they were miserable. Jesus, he pulled the curtain back and exposed them for what they really were. That Pharisee who prayed with himself, I thank thee that I am not like other men. Well, he was, he was really using a slothful rule of judgment. He thought he was not like other men just because he, he was using a bad, uh, a, a bad uh, rule ruler. He was comparing himself among himself. He came up with the wrong, with the wrong, um, the wrong answer. He was slothful in his mind. He was slothful in his judgment. He wasn't. He, in fact, he was probably worse than a lot of people, and he certainly was worse than the than the other man who prayed that Jesus that Jesus pointed out. Judas, I, I hadn't thought about sloth in connection with with Judas before, but it. It's there. It, see, it, 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 he was slothful because he, he entertained some, some thoughts that he shouldn't have. Mm-hmm. See, Judas didn't fall just like that. It, it, did, it wasn't just like uh, uh, just all of a sudden, bang, and, and Judas thought, what happened? No, he didn't, didn't the Holy Spirit say that he, he kept the bag and he bare what was there in it was mentioned this morning only 30 pieces of silver but he had cultured a weakness for silver for covetousness and so he traded he valued the 30 pieces of silver above the only begotten son of god it was sloth the 10 spies they came back and said oh the walled cities and the giants and the the fortifications and the weaponry and they were slothful that was a slothful report that they'd forgotten what God, God said, I will give you the land. I'll drive out the inhabitants. You're going to live in houses you didn't build. They saw the houses and they said, we can't take them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was slothful. They'd forgotten what God, God told them about the land and they forgot about it. God told them he would give it. And it just, it, what God said, it didn't, it didn't stay long enough to change the way they thought. They were, they were slothful. That was, they were slothful thinkers. They were slothful rememberers. They were slothful meditators. They didn't, it was sloth. That's why they, 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 the, what God had promised them didn't work in them what it worked in Joshua and Caleb. Amen. Amen. Jesus addressed some people that followed him only because they ate the bread and they were filled. That was slothful. So much more that they could have had. There was a bread that Jesus was giving that men may eat thereof and not die, but that wasn't why they followed him. They were, they were slothful, slothful hearers. What about the Galatians? The Holy Spirit said, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? See, sloth got in there somewhere. And they thought, their, their thinking got... Um, it got turned to one side or the other. It got, it got infiltrated, and they, they forgot how they started. Brethren, we're going to finish the race the same way we began. Amen. We began by believing on Jesus, and you endure by believing on Jesus, and you finish by believing on Jesus. That's a, you begin in the Spirit, and you end in the Spirit. He's the, he's the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He's the author, and he's the finisher. But the Galatians were slothful. Well, I want to, I want to read several... Um, text from the book of Hebrews, I always want to connect whatever text, you know, I started in the first chapter, first book, or first uh, verse of, of Hebrews, and we're just going verse by verse, sometimes two or three verses, but I don't, I don't ever want to, want to hone in uh, to, a, to a verse so tightly that we forget why, why it was there. That's, a, that's one of the edificating, uh, ed- edifying parts of, uh, of understanding and, and seeing, seeing the Word of God is, is seeing why, why it's there and what um, you know what led up to it, and then what's going to be built built yeah. onto it afterwards. Yeah. You don't you don't want to be you know word, just word studies will really leave you dry. <laughs> it's not that you don't want a, a regular diet of word studies. You want to you want to know 
You want you want to get the spirit of why of, of why the Holy Spirit why the whole, why did the Holy Spirit put Hebrews six twelve in Hebrews six twelve? Why didn't it go in in Hebrews twelve six? Well, there's there's a there's a reason. So I want to I want to kind of place Hebrews six twelve in Hebrews. Where did it go? And this is not like in, an introduction of new material. He, when he says that you be not slothful, see he already he'd already addressed this in some other places. Hebrews two one. He says, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed. Yeah. See, he's warning them against slothfulness. Amen. We ought to give the more earnest heed. God has been speaking out of heaven through his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, who is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. And God said unto my God, thou art a priest forever. And this is who's speaking. We ought to give the more earnest heed. See, so it, th this subject, this topic of slothfulness, he's already been bringing this up. Chapter 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Neglect is slothfulness. Hebrews 3, 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. Now, that word consider is not just like, uh, keep, keep this option, you know, on, on the table. Don't forget about this option called Jesus. You, I've heard people today say, try Jesus. I want to say, no, don't try Jesus. Yeah. Jesus, God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. There is a, that, that, that's, just the, that's just the wrong way to represent Jesus. Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our profession. Why did he say that? Because they were forgetting him. Jesus was being eclipsed by, by form and by, by uh, rituals, by, by feasts and dates and things like this. See, Jesus is the one who has eclipsed those things. But when you get things the other way around, then they will eclipse Jesus. Hebrews 3, verse 6. But Christ has a son over his own house. Whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? See, he's exhorting them to diligence, to be fervent, to be zealous. He's, he's exhorting them against Slothfulness. Chapter 4, verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left of, of entering into his rest in any of you should seem to come, come short of it. The slothfulness is one of those things like, remember Jude, he talked about those who crept in unawares. And they, and they came, though they were men, but they crept in unawares. They had, a, they had an agenda that was unspoken and undisplayed. And see, slothfulness can creep in. So we must, we, we, have, we have need of, of endurance. And so we, we all stand in need. You don't ever want to become, um, you don't want to ever let yourself think that you're, that you're past the need of, of this type of exhortation. Yeah. We, we desire that every one of you, that, that you be not slothful, That's but right. followers of them who through faith and patience in, inherit the, pro, the, the promises. So consider these other exhortations. Uh, that we find in the scriptures, <clears throat> Peter said, gird up the loins of your mind. You think about how much work you do with your mind. Yeah. Gird up the loins of your mind. If you, if you can't, if God, if you can't think with God, labor in God, labor in your mind, in your thoughts with God, then you're just not going to go very far in the kingdom. God didn't send us a book of, of, uh, pictures and illustrations. He sent, he sent a message. And he sends messengers. See, a book, a book, God sent a book. He sent a word. This tells us that you're going to have to think with God. Amen. That gird up the loins of your mind. I love that where Peter put that in um, 1 Peter 1, I believe it was, the first chapter of one of his books. He's talking about the prophets, what the, what the prophets spoke of. And he says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. You're going to have to think about what God has said. You're going to have to like, like dig in and labor in your, in your mind on what God has said. <clears throat> Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, Romans chapter 12. See, that's the opposite of, you can't be slothful and do this. Be transformed by the renewing, renewing of your mind. This, this constant uh, 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 laboring in your, in your thoughts, in your minds. This is another way of saying, love the Lord thy God with all your mind. Love him with your thoughts. Think on these things. Yeah, yeah. Philippians chapter 4. Whatsoever things are lovely and true and pure and of good report, think on these things. Amen. See, you, you gotta, you, you've, you've got to apply 
You've got to put your hand to this to this work. Think on these things. How easy is it? I mean, there's just the there's a better way of saying that. <clears throat> Satan has no shortage of things for you to think about. The world is full of worthless things for you to think about, to occupy your mind. And the, see that those who don't think on these things, their minds become like that vineyard of Isaiah five. It just it's just o- overgrown and and um, and it just it does, doesn't uh, produce anything. So just like a vineyard that the stones have to be gathered out, see there, there's things that have to be gathered out of your thinking. Just like the, there has to be a wall built around a vineyard, see you got to build you got to build some layer of protection, some layer of de- some line of demarcation in your mind, in your thoughts. Think on these things. Take heed that you be not deceived. See, this is all. This is all to you. You gotta. You gotta throw yourself into this. Take Amen. heed yeah. that you be not deceived. Deceivers never do advertise themselves as deceivers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Never do. That you be not slothful. I've learned, brother, and I, I exhort you with this. <clears throat> this thought: the closer you grow to the Lord, the more you hate slothfulness. There's just certain things, uh, the, the closer you are to the world, see, you, 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 you grow this, this affinity to certain things as, as a person dwells closer to the world. And as you draw close to the Lord, then you're, you see those affinities change, those preferences change. So you become very uncomfortable with other things yeah. because, of your, because of your closeness to the Lord. Amen. But followers of them, <clears throat> be not slothful, but followers of them. Now we have we have a much traveled way before us. Be followers of them. Amen. None of us, brethren, are blazing a trail in the kingdom. We're following. Yeah. We're following a well traveled way. This this straight and narrow way that leads to life, we're not at all the first ones to travel. Yeah. Amen. This is a this is a well traveled way well-traveled path. We're following the footsteps of them who through faith and patience inherited the promises. It's a temptation from the wicked one to think that we're alone in our experiences. Mm-hmm. That since I've... See, people are actually troubled by these kind of temptations. Since I've given my life to the Lord, all these bad things have happened to me. Mm-hmm. See, that's a, that's a, it's a temptation. And if you, and if you unpeel... You know, peel back the layers. What it is is a temptation to think that you're experiencing something that no one ever has. That that's kind of that's kind of the the hidden kernel in a lot of temptations that come from the devil is that no one's ever had this. And boy, self pity will just drive you down to where you can't you can't even look up at all. But be be followers of them. See, we're following, brethren. That Peter encouraged the people he wrote to, those who were scattered, with it. the same as sufferings are accomplished by your brethren in the world. Amen. You're not experiencing this alone. Yeah. <coughs> Abraham, he went, we're following Abraham in faith. See, Abraham led out in believing God. Yeah. He, was a, he was a father. He was a, now, Abraham was blazing a trail mm-hmm. that no one had blazed before. But we're, we're not. We're following them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Job led out in patience. Job didn't have the record of Job to go back and be comforted by. We do. We're following. We're following. Job was one in, in the front. He was like one in the front of the pack up there with Abraham. Well, we're following. Joseph, he was, he was uh, leading out in faithfulness to God. Everything he did, he did it. He did it. For the Lord, out of conscience toward God, he was—he was technically he was in Potiphar's house, but re, but really he was serving God. Technically he was in the in the prison, but really he was serving God. And technically he was on the throne, but really he was serving God. He was—he led out in this faithfulness to God. He was—he served God um, before, but and we're we're followers. See, there's all there's someone that has gone before us. Daniel led out in discernment and wisdom and understanding. Joshua, Caleb, they led out in overcoming and victory. David led out in having a heart towards God and desire and affections toward Him. Jeremiah led out in tenderness toward the people of God and the thing the places where God had worked. Noah led out in diligence and in, in his work. See, we're followers. You want to you want to be 
be sensitive to these temptations of Satan to make Satan turn your eyes in, inward. It's very dangerous. Amen. Now, follower has actually today, follower has been used in a derogatory way. Do you think about this? Oh, he's just a follower. <laughs> well, here we have the Holy Spirit saying, be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. That's just like the devil, isn't it? Turn it, if, it if time keeps going, he's going to turn faith into being something derogatory. He's going to turn the word grace into being something derogatory because there's, there's, no, there's no end to where uh, he can, he can take, take people. As, so to some people, followers means that they're, they're just mindless. They're just, they're just following. In fact, you know, I, I've really become uncomfortable. Been, I've become intolerant of this. People uh, talking about sheep and we're the sheep and we're called sheep because sheep are dumb. They're just followers. <laughs> no, they don't, they don't, this is not, this, this, these things just ought not to be. And at some point, you know, we don't answer a fool according to his folly. There are some questions that you just don't answer. Now, in the world, in elementary school, they'll, tell, they'll say there is no wrong question. There's no such thing as a dumb question. And maybe young children do need to be told that. But adults need to be told there are dumb questions. There are questions that shouldn't be asked and shouldn't be answered. Follow me, Paul said, as I follow Christ. Amen. That's anything but mindless or naive. And he said, he put a qualifier on it. Did you hear it? As I follow Christ. So really what Paul, Paul's motive was getting people going in the same direction as him, which is following Christ, not just following him. See, there, Paul was very, he was very very discerning in these ways. He knew that there was, a, there was a place, there was a condition that people could be where they really just needed to follow Paul. Maybe there, maybe there wasn't enough light in them. Maybe there wasn't enough vision, enough determination to just, uh, to just follow Christ for who Christ is. But Paul knew this is like uh, one effort, one way in which he became um, all things to all men. He said, just follow me. Follow me as I, as I follow Christ. He knew that there was going to come a time of when people followed him as he followed Christ, that they were going to be following Christ, not Paul. That's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful provision. In the book of Hebrews, we have this exhortation of who, whose faith follow, the elders the, and the deacons that are put in the, in the church. Whose faith follow, co considering the end of their conversation. Yes, amen. So this is not followers, is not, uh, just naively, blindly, I can put my brain on the shelf because I'm just following. No, who's in? Who's con the end? Considering the end of their conversation, Paul said, "Judge ye what I say." There was some sarcasm in that. He said it to the Corinthians. He said, "But judge ye what I say." See, so in our follow, there's discernment in following. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. He's talking about men. He that is spiritual judges all things. But be followers of them. What a, what a gracious provision that the Lord has given us in, in the kingdom to be followers of them who through faith and patience. So this is believing God and losing your life that you may obtain, keep it unto eternal life. This is not just a shot in the dark. We are following them who through faith and patience, they've already inherited. And though Abraham inherited the promises that God gave him. He already has. He, he's received it. Their faith and patience. Now, these think there are some things in the kingdom that belong together, like faith and patience. There are some things that don't, like holy thief. <laughs> no such thing, right? You can't get stealing and holy together. But faith and patience. These things go to they, they're like they're like uh, partners. They labor together. Faith and patience, and patience and faith. It's kind of like, like Moses and the law. Those things go go together. No no eyebrows go up when we say Moses and the law. See, David and the Psalms, they, they go together. Noah and the ark, Paul and Timothy, they, they go together. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? Well, faith and patience, see, they're, they're walking together because they're, they're agreed. Abraham and faith, they go together. How about grace and mercy? Yeah. They go together. Yeah. They're, they're agreed. They're, uh, they're, 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 they're very happy to, uh, to abide one another's company, so to speak. Faith and uh, grace and peace. Joy and strength, they go together. It's hard to be 
Hard to be strong without joy, but you, the joy of the Lord is your strength. See, there's things in the kingdom that just go together. They, they pair up like Jonathan and David. They, they just pair up together. The word of God and power. Those are, they're paired together. Suffering and comfort, they're paired together. Now, patience is the companion of faith, and faith is the companion of, of, of uh, patience. Faith, in a very real way, faith gives birth to patience. You can't, no man, let me put it this way. Men who believe God are men who endure. If you believe, you can endure. You believe what God has said, then you, you can endure. What is, what is seen, for the most part, what is seen opposes what is said. Let me just, Abraham is a perfect example of this. I'll make you a father of many nations. Boy, when Moses, when he looked in, he thought, how can these things be? He looked at his wife and he thought, how can these things be? But, what, but he endured. Abraham believed God. He was old, his body was dead, his wife was old, her womb was barren, and Abraham believed God. And that's who we're following, whose faith, Amen. whose uh, followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The substance of things hoped for empowers patience. It enables. Who through faith and patience. Read it this way. Who through the substance of things hoped for and patience obtain the promise. See, it, it, it doesn't read strange, does it? Faith and patience. Through the substance of things hoped for, obtain the promise. And the, the, the other definition of faith, the evidence of things not seen, who through the evidence of things not seen and patience, obtain the promise. See, they go together. <clears throat> See, what we, will, what we will receive then, that's hope, what we will receive then profoundly affects how we live now. Yeah. Now think about, just pause there. There, there are, this was mentioned this morning about, about health and wealth. I don't want to spend a lot of time about this, but just on this, but just think of what a, what a deadly, deadly attack this is to anchor people's minds and hearts in this world. Yeah. Amen. Faith anchors you in the world to come. Right. And when you're, see, the only way to escape and to, to make it successfully through this world is to be uprooted and anchored there. That's, the only, that's, that's how it works. This is like what we call, we could call this kingdom logic. The way, the way we're preserved in this world is, by be, is uprooted and delivered, like Galatians 1.4. He's delivered us from this present world according to the will of God and his Father, and he's made us citizens there. Now you can live effectively here. That, 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 that's good to know. The things not seen are far superior to living in this world than the things that do appear. Mm -hmm. So it's faith and faith and patience in, endured the promises. So, <clears throat> see, the, uh, the ten spies report was because there was no faith yeah. in the report. Right. Yeah. No faith, no patience. Joshua and Caleb, they were the two. <laughs> you, get back, you think, you read that report, he just, it makes you want to shake your head. Twelve men went and saw the same thing at the same time and came back and gave two completely different reports. How, how can these things be? Is it ten looked without faith, two looked with faith? That, that's the explanation. Remember Brother Gibbon, he said this before. Years ago, I remember him saying that if a, if a newspaper reporter was, was sent on that trip, they would have agreed with the spies because what they said, what they said with the ten, I mean, what they said was true. Right. It's just that they didn't see it with faith. Yeah. Yeah. See, Joshua and Caleb, they had the evidence of things not seen. Yeah. And so when they looked, they saw bread. Yeah. These giants, they're just going to be bread. Right. They'll be, they, they will be as bread. Yeah. But it didn't look like that at all without faith. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I exhort you, brethren, believe at all costs. Whatever, whatever you have to do to believe God, just do it. Amen. You, you, you got to, Sister uh, Melissa, I thought about this this morning when she was talking about taking the kingdom with violence. There's, yeah. there's, sometimes you just got to, uh, like Brother Bob has said, you just got to look in the mirror and point at that man in the mirror and say, you're a dead man. Yeah. You just got to, that's, that's part of, of taking the kingdom by violence. You just got to, you just got to do 
what it, whatever is, is necessary to, to believe God. Amen. Work to believe, labor to believe. <clears throat> it's, a, it's wonderful. You draw close enough to God that unbelief is just foolish. Live close enough to God that unbelief is just utterly foolish. Wavering, staggering, stumbling, drawing back, fainting, falling, hardened, all have to do with unbelief. Yeah, Every one of them. Mm-hmm. Well, here's the concluding point. <clears throat> through, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. Mm-hmm. I'd already mentioned this, this uh, verse as an introduction to Abraham and the promises that God gave him. God works through promises. Mm-hmm. He always has. When God, when God does something, you can always look back and find that he promised it before he did it. Amen. Yeah. He always does. He promised the flood before he did it. He promised the exodus before he did it. He promised Isaac before he showed up. He promised Jesus before he came. Yeah. He's always promising, and it's because the promises do a work. That's right. the, the promises do it. They're like, they're like heavenly servants. So God, God makes a promise, and these promises land in earth, and, get to, and, they, and they go to work. They're working in you. I can, I can see the work that, prom, that the promises have done in you yeah. because you are desiring a better country yeah. and you for, you've, you're willing to, uh, you've lost your life in this world. Why? Because God gave you a promise. Yeah. The promises work mm-hmm. in the people. Inherit, inherit the promises. Now, <clears throat> it seems like every, every time that we, we say something good like that, we have to, we have, to say, we have to say something about, about these atrocities that are being, being touted today. Mm-hmm. But the promises of God are being individualized mm-hmm. today. Yeah. People are saying, they're, 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 it's like they're, they're transforming, they're, they're morphing and, and changing these promises as if God kind of uh, knelt down, you know, bow, bowed over to you and said, what, what would you like your promise to be? Yeah. And... And people even say, just take all your hopes and dreams to God, and God can make your dreams come true. Yeah. Well, not if they're evil. Yeah, that's right. And what did James say about those who, they made requests that they, that they might consume it on their own lust? That, that's very contemporary. The promises, inherit the promises that we're talking about, are the revealed promises. They're not, they're not the promises of God are not different for me than they are for you. It's what God has promised to those that believe. It's not what God has promised to Aaron and what God has promised to Jeremy. And now, now they are for Aaron and they are for Jeremy, but it, they, they're written. They're revealed promises. They're inspired promises. It's, here's, a, here's, the, a one pro, here's some promises that we are waiting to inherit. I will receive you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, that's a, enter in. That's, that's the promise we're waiting to inherit. That promise, I will receive you. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. See, that's, that's, an, that's part of the inheritance that we're waiting for. I will wipe all tears from off their, off their eyes. Um, th- th- he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. That's, that's our inheritance. Part of our inheritance, we're waiting to receive that. The tabernacle of God is with men. We're waiting. We're following them who the some have already received it. There's already, think about it this way, brother. There's already been some who passed through the second death and they weren't hurt by it. Yeah, that's right. We know, brethren, we know some brethren by name who have passed through the second death and they were not hurt by it. Yeah. They were not fearful by it. They were not fearful of it. They received the inheritance. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's, an, that, that's our inheritance. We will be like him. Hosea 2.14, the Lord said, I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably to her. It, Hosea 2.14, I will allure. He's alluring with promises. No one's going to come out of the world until they see something better. And no one's going to dis- deny themselves. Until they, have, until they have a reason to do it. Yeah. Obligation doesn't go very far. Yeah. The pearl of great price and the treasure hid in the field. And when people see the pearl, 
then something happens. When they find the treasure, then something happens. You can't, you can't reproduce the effects of the pearl, listen, without the pearl. <laughs> when you have the pearl, then people sell all they have to buy the pearl. See, that's the inheriting, the inherit, receiving the inheritance, inherit the promises. Uh, to Abraham, he promised, I would make you a father of many nations. He said, I will bless all the families of the earth in you. He said, you, to you and your children, I will give this land. All of the promises were things he had to wait for. Yeah, that's right. Every one of them. None of them were, he, did, he received none of the promises the day they were given. They, he had to wait for them. Promise and inheritance both carry, carry waiting with them. Promises, you gotta, it was promised because you have to wait for it. And inheritance is what you have to wait for. It was the prodigal son who demanded his inheritance now. Yeah. It, was a wic it was wickedness. And he said, yeah. uh, he wasn't willing to wait for it. Yeah. Give it to me now. Yeah. And, he, and he squandered it. It was a wicked thing. It's, uh, it's very uncommon for men to go to, their, to go to their inheritance quickly after they believe the gospel. That's not the rule. You don't see people just dropping dead because they believed. Uh, it, can't, it can't happen. We, we, you know, we, we know of those who, who received the Lord and confessed on their deathbed, and we give thanks for that. What I'm saying is that's not normal. What's normal is that you have to wait. You have to have patience. And see, in the interim, from the time you receive the promise until the time you receive it, you receive the promise till the time you receive you, you receive what was promised, there's a whole lot of work that's going to happen between those two points. And in fact, every one of you right now are between those two points because you're still breathing. I can tell that. You're still waiting. Waiting, hoping, enduring, watching. They're all, we're all exercised in our waiting. We're all exercised in our hoping, in the enduring, in the watching. We're all exercised by these things. They're, they're actually they're perfecting us. The waiting, the perfect, it, it's making us, so we through the Spirit do wait for the hope of righteousness. Well, I, I, I ask you to be content in your waiting. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You're not going to be disappointed. Amen. Yeah. Just because you're waiting doesn't mean that you'll never have it. Mm -hmm. Romans 8.25, if we, hope, if we uh, hope for what we do not see, then do we with patience wait for it. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, they turn from idols to serve the living God and to wait for his son from heaven. Hebrews 9.28, he is coming uh, to them that look for him, shall he appear a second time. So I, you're, you're, in good, you're in a great company of those who are waiting to inherit the promise. So I, I encourage you to be, uh, to be diligent in your waiting, to be diligent in your looking. And the Lord, the Lord himself has, has com he's committed himself to not let those who wait on him be disappointed. Amen. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. You will run, you will fly, and you will walk and not faint. Be encouraged by that. Amen.